Hi, and welcome back to the shop. Today, well, is part 10 in our series of videos that's all about jigs and fixtures. So, Michel is wondering why I don't turn the lathe on when I saw parts uh, on the lathe. And well, that's a good question. It has to do with safety, so I think it's something we should look at at the end of the video. Why? Well, because I tend to give long and drawn out explanations and well, I'll lose half of you before we even get to the subject of today's video, which is positioning our drill bushing in our drill jig. It goes somewhere up here, and actually I know that if we look at our part and it's drawing, I want it to be a quarter inch in from the back of the part and a quarter inch in from the side. Now, the problem here is that my jig well, has a certain thickness at the bottom there and a th certain thickness at the side here. And that means that when I'm holding this in the mill and I edge find my back and my side, I have to add those thicknesses if I want to get that hole in the proper relation to the part. So I'll have to measure that and that's what we're going to start out with. So we want to measure this edge and the back thickness here from the bottom to the back. Let's start with the easiest one. We'll go here and that will give us okay 379. Okay 379 and I want that plus 250 because that's where I want the hole to be on my part. So 379 plus at 250, that's going to give me 529 thousandths of an inch. From here, zero, advance, 529 thousandths of an inch. That's where I want my hole to be for my drill bushing. And from the back edge here, well, we can measure that also. But it's going to be a little less dainty, mainly because I want to show what I'm doing here. And, well... Measuring at the back there isn't going to work, you see? No, don't worry. We do it the other way around. There you go. Okay. And it still isn't going to be very dainty because I want to show what I'm doing. That means I've got to awkwardly hold this part and this tool to get down to the bottom there. So we'll do it this way. Even though it's not pretty. Just come close to snug, and now we can do it with a little more feeling. There, and I can see that I'm 21 thousandths of an inch past 125. So 125 thousandths of an inch plus 21 thousandths of an inch, well that gives me 146 thousandths of an inch, and that's the thickness of the bottom there. So 146 thousandths of an inch plus the 250 that I want to get to my hole in this axis here from the back, well, that will, just hang on, that will be uh, 146 plus 250, and that's going to give me 396 thousandths of an inch. So from this edge, 529, from this edge, 396, bang, that's where I want my hole. You know, it's always good to follow your own advice, and well I haven't, because I really haven't planned my part out very well, or this jig, and I've machined myself into a corner. What I mean by that is, in blue here, I have my half inch diameter, and in red I have my quarter inch diameter, which will be the inside diameter of my drill bushing. The outside diameter, well, is a half inch, and I have a real problem here. My half inch breaks into that uh, corner clearance hole, and that means I'm going to grab there, and the hole just will not go in the right place. What can I do? Well, what I should have done would be to drill that hole before I pocket it out the pocket, or I machined out the pocket, I should say, then I could have plugged that hole with a light press fit 
with a piece of steel, the same type as what the jig is made of. Then I could have drilled and reamed my half inch hole. Then I could have extracted that pin. Then I could have milled my pocket and everything would have been fine. But now I'm in trouble and it'll be a learning experience. Uh, plan your things out well. Remember uh, the series of videos on uh, the planning of projects while well, sequence of operations? I didn't do it here and I'm paying for it. But what I am going to do, because it's a learning experience, and there's two options, I haven't made up my mind yet, but both involve drilling and reaming a quarter inch hole. That fits in there, I know that. Now, in the first option, well, seeing as I'm only making a, a very low amount of parts, I could come and just drill uh, those holes using that hole as a guide. But it would wear out quickly, seeing as it's a very deep hole, and chips are going to be coming up there, and a lot of rubbing is going to be going on. So if I did that, well, I would probably just drill in maybe a quarter inch, a tops half inch, and just say, okay, that's that. I'll finish the rest off in the drill press without the jig because my hole would already be in the right place. Now, I got to mention that the positioning of this quarter inch hole is way less accurate than the positioning of the two holes in the primary surface. So I'm not too worried about precision here. The other option we could have here is, well, to drill a quarter inch, ream it, and then use a quarter inch diameter hole punch, or punch, I should say, to come and just mark the part in there, and, well, then go finish it on the drill press. So both options are open. I'm not sure what we're going to do. But for now, we're going to just drill and ream that quarter inch. And that has its own little problem. And that is that I'm going to come very close, or flush, really, with the edge of that hole. That means that the support of the machining on this side is going to get weaker as we go down. And well, that can cause a problem. Not more than likely, but it could. Not just It's a small diameter drill, so I'm not expecting a lot of problems here. But just to make sure that I don't screw up a second time, I'm going to put a brass plug, a press fit, light press fit brass plug in there just to support the part. Now, when we did the half inch hole, or we, if we'd done the half inch hole before all else and it would have worked, I would have had a steel plug in there because the drill has to not notice a difference. The same material it's got to meet. But in this case, the drill will never meet that, punt, that pin. It's going to come close. So seeing as brass is a lot easier to press in and press out, that's what I'm going to use. And even though it's softer, it will give all the support I need to support that edge of the hole as we're producing it. So. Follow your own advice. That's my advice.
Here you can see what I meant when I said that the hole that we're drilling and reaming is going to feather up to the other hole. It's right there and flush. So that's why we needed that little bit of pin to support it. So now we can move on to looking at how we're going to arrange things so that our part stays pushed up against its reference surfaces. As you may know, this is the 10th video in this series of videos. And I must admit, I'm getting a little tired of this project. So I've decided to save a little time and replace my two ball spring apparatus that I planned for with a simple, dense neoprene uh, compression type spring. So this is one that I've produced. And as you can see, I have a cylindrical part that fits down in the hole. Actually, it's compressed down in there. And at the end here, well, I have a little triangular feature that will serve as a cushion upon which the corner of my part will rest. Now, this one was a little small, so I've made another one, and you can see it's installed right here. And that, well, will push my part up against its secondary reference and its tertiary reference, and, well, when I tighten the whole thing down in the vise, it'll push the part up against its primary reference surface down there. Now, this is very simple to produce, and, well, it saves me a lot of time. So, here's my tool, here's my part. We can insert that just in there like so. And as you can see, it's resting up on my secondary and up on my tertiary. So, we're good to go. We can go and start drilling. So, there we go. We have our eight pieces and our two jigs. The jigs were used to drill three holes in each of the eight parts. Now, obviously, that was a lot of work for three holes in eight parts. But had we been doing 100 parts, well, this really would have sped things up. So, that's that. We still have one jig left to go. 
And if we look at one of our pieces here, well, we can see that we have an angle there, but on our drawing, we have a mirrored angle on that side that is going to come through that hole. That's why we drilled the hole before we put the angle on. And, well, that's what we'll be doing in our next video. But, before I go, uh, someone asked me a question, and they were wondering why I'd never used the hacksaw on the lathe when the lathe is actually spinning. And, well, really, it has to do with safety. That's why I don't do it. Now, when you cut with a bandsaw, or oh, a bandsaw, a hacksaw, well, and it works with a bandsaw as well, but you wouldn't be putting a bandsaw on the lathe, right? Okay, just bear with me. As I cut, the teeth will enter at one end of the part and exit the other. And between the time that they enter and the time that they exit, they can't get gummed up. In other words, the space between each teeth, each tooth, mustn't become charged full of chip because then my saw is going to start rubbing and riding up instead of cutting through. And that's why we have different blade pitches. That has a lot to do with A, the hardness of the material, but quite often also B, the width of the cut or the length of the cut that I have to perform. So that's one practical reason because when I cut on the lathe and the part is spinning, Quite often, people tend to not cut with a full stroke motion that would permit uh, to start and end and clear the chips out, come back, start and end. So that's on the practical side. Now, if you do cut on the lathe, and I recommend that you don't when it's spinning, well, if it is spinning, remember you're going to have to slow down your movement, and at the end, well, things won't really go that much quicker. But, imagine that your blade gets stuck in that groove, because as long as you're cutting straight with nothing moving, you can go crooked. It's not the end of the world. I mean, it's not straight, but it won't kill you. However, if you're cutting on the lathe and the lathe is spinning, and if your cut starts to go sideways, well, you're actually producing a cone. And that means that your blade is going to get twisted inside there and eventually what well, could jam. Now that requires a little more explanation. So what we have here is a cylindrical part and I have a hidden line here that shows the bottom there but it's really there should be more than one but it's just to show that it's a cylindrical shaped part third angle projection here. <clears throat> now if I cut into the part with a hacksaw and I cut in straight I'm going to end up with something like this a groove. And if I carry on, well, I'll come right through my part. This is the best situation. Now, if I'm using a hacksaw and I'm cutting straight and the lathe is turning, I'm going to end up with something like this. So I'll be cutting both sides at the same time because the part's in rotation. I'll have to advance a lot slower and, well, it, there is a real possibility here that the friction and the lack of movement, because we tend to not cut full length of blade when we do this, well, could gum up your teeth, and well, that will cause a problem here. And if your teeth do get gummed up or filled with chips, the spaces between the teeth, well, you know, it's going to jam in there. That's a problem. Now, if I cut crooked, and honestly, most of the time we always cut at least a little crooked. So let's exaggerate. If I cut crooked here, I end up with this. And if I keep on going, I cut all the way through the part. This is not dangerous in any way. It's just not very good. Now, this is grossly exaggerated. But obviously, I want to cut as straight as possible to save as much material as possible. So not a problem safety-wise, but maybe not the most efficient way of doing it because the cut's going to have to be a lot longer as well. Now, if I cut through the part when the part is turning, I should, if I imagine it, end up with something like this. I'm going to have a cone on this side, not a straight line like I had here, but real cone 
because I'm cutting both sides at the same time. And I should have an internal cone as well. Note that I said should, because that is impossible. Your blade is straight, or it wants to be straight. And if it does that, what you're really going to end up with is this here. So your cone on the inside, and on the other side of the cut, well, you're going to end up with a relatively flat surface. This is a horrible situation, because obviously on one side it'll be lifting the blade up. On the other side, your side, it'll be pushing the blade down. It's not going to want to cut very easily because you're trying to cut that whole surface. And what will you be doing? You'll be pushing harder because you're going to say, oh, this isn't cutting very well. And you can jam it in because this obviously is a little make-believe. When we're off, we're not that much off. We're just a little crooked. And it's when it's you're a little crooked that this is the most dangerous. Now, the body of your hacksaw blade is just slightly wider than the teeth, where that's called the kerf. How much wider the groove is going to be from the body. Now, if you're coming down at an angle with an, even a slight angle with the lathe turning, you are going to rub the sides of your blades uh, a lot. And it won't take very much out of line here for that to happen. And that creates heat. And that creates friction, which creates heat, which can seize up your blade in that groove. And that obviously is a problem. So really, the best way to cut here, the safest way to cut, would be to cut as straight as possible. But if you do go at an angle, do it when the lathe isn't in rotation. It is much, much safer. Now, if the blade jams and you're cutting on a part held in a vise, well, that's a bummer, but it's not the end of the world. Over on the lathe, if it jams, it could break the blade. The blade is in a part that's turning at a high rate of speed. And the blade will, well, it is quite sharp. It may very well start to spin with that. Now, if it spins a few turns and comes out, well, it could be going through your forehead. But if not, if it stays there, well, it could be chopping body parts off. And that, well, is a huge problem. So in order to cut properly, well remember, we reviewed how to use hacksaws and choose the blades and how hardness and width of cut affect that selection. We looked at all that in our hand tools series of videos. But if you do use it on the lathe, don't turn the lathe on. Use the lathe as a vise, just to hold your part while you're cutting. Well, because the plan B would be to get a good brush and start picking up fingers on the ground. So, something to avoid whenever possible. Now, we still have a jig to produce. We're going to be producing a vise jaw fixture, not a vise jaw fixture. It is a vise jaw fixture. <laughs> We, have, uh, we don't have any more jigs to produce. Jigs are for drilling holes. Fixtures are for orienting a part uh, in relation to a tool. And that's what we do on the mill. So we're going to be producing a vice jaw fixture to produce that angle on the part. And that's what we'll be doing in our next series, or not series, but in our next video, the 11th video of this series. And I really, really hope it's the last one of this series because this project's starting to get on my nerves. Oh, any, regardless, we're going to be looking at that in our next video. So until then, have fun. Be safe. Truly, be safe. And happy machining.